Hello, my name is Bill Robbins. In this video I'm going to talk about insulated gate bipolar junction transistors, or IGBTs for short. In particular I'm going to talk about the following topics. The construction and IV characteristics of the IGBT, brief description of the physical operation of these devices, their switching characteristics, and finally limitations and safe operating areas. Going on to the next slide, here we see the multi-stell structure of the IGBT. And the first impression is it looks very much like the uh, structure for a power MOSFET. And indeed, uh, this is basically how an IGBT is constructed. The main difference being the injecting contact down here at the uh, collector end of the device. The collector being here at this point, the drain, I mean the emitter being here, the uh, contact where we normally think of it as the source. And the injecting contact is this area right in here that I am circling, this P plus diffusion that's bucked up against the uh, cathode, I mean against the uh, collector region. This forms an injecting contact which then allows us to flood the drift region, the N- region, with a large number of excess carriers and thus uh, overcome the problem that the power MOSFET has at higher breakdown voltages, namely the high resistance region which is necessary. The N plus layer that's shown here next to the P plus region is not essential for the IGBT. And this leads to two types of IGBTs, the so-called non-punch non through IGBT which is without the uh, buffer layer and in that case the device has a substantial reverse blocking capability. If it does have this buffer layer then the PN junction between the P plus and the N plus has a very small breakdown voltage and thus the device is not going to have much of a reverse blocking capability. Going on to the next slide we see a, a more detailed uh, picture of the device just showing a single unit cell and it is composed of the emitter which you see at the top, the N plus region, the P type body region, then the N minus drift region and finally the P plus injecting contact. Aside from its similarity to the uh, MOSFET, the main feature as I've already emphasized is this P plus region and when the device is on your current flow is from here bending over going to the emitter area as I've indicated there. There is an alternative path for current to flow which I'm showing here as a dotted line which is something that we want to avoid and I'll have more to say about that later. So the desired path is the one I'm showing as a solid line. The undesired path between collector and emitter is the one that I showed as a dotted structure. Again, the P-type region at the collector end is a unique feature of the IGBT. We call it a punch-through device if the buffer layer is there and a non-punch-through device when that buffer layer is absent. Otherwise, the device has, as I've indicated here, a four-layer structure composed of P-plus region, an N-type region, the P-type body, and finally the N-plus emitter. Looking at that, you can see why on the left-hand side I have labeled the three junctions, J1, J2, and J3. We have a built-in parasitic thyristor. So, the price we pay for having the injecting contact is we have a parasitic thyristor. And we have to be aware of that and hopefully avoid ever turning on that, para that parasitic thyristor. Because if it turns on, we have no way of turning it off by means of gate control. We would have to rely on the external voltage going negative, with res the collector going negative with respect to the emitter in order to turn it off. And since IGBTs may be used in a circuit that's powered by DC, especially if we're using a punch-through device where it has no reverse blocking capability, we would have no way of turning it off. And thus we would probably destroy the device and maybe also damage the converter in which the IGBT is embedded. So we want to keep that in mind as we go forward in discussing the operation. Going to the next slide, here I show a more detailed 
picture of two types of IGBTs, types meaning how they're fabricated. The top one is a non-punch through IGBT and both of these are based on the trench gate technology that we uh, talked about earlier when we were talking about MOSFETs. Here the current flow again is vertical but as you see in the non-punch through IGBT we don't have the buffer layer up against this p-type injecting contact. For the punch through structure we do have the buffer layer and hence this structure does not have any reverse blocking capability. And again, I want to emphasize the presence of the parasitic thyristor in both of these geometries. Going on now to the IV characteristics. I need to change the slide. Here are the IV characteristics of our device. If you look at the collector current as a function of the collector emitter voltage, the thing that distinguishes one current from the other is the value of the gate emitter voltage. And so it looks very much like a MOSFET. The only way you would be able to tell the difference between this output characteristic being an IGBT and a very similar one being a MOSFET is the magnitude of the currents and the labeling that we have on here. For a high voltage MOSFET our maximum current would only be a few amps but when we're talking about an IGBT intended for high voltage we may be talking tens or even hundreds of amps depending on if the basic structure is several IGBT chips in parallel. Again, if the device is a uh, non-punch through device without the buffer layer, the reverse blocking voltage is about the same as the forward blocking voltage. If we have the punch through device, then your reverse blocking capability is going to look more like this and you would have essentially no reverse blocking capability to talk about. The transfer characteristic shown here in the upper right has the collector current as a function of the gate emitter voltage and it looks very much like that for a MOSFET. Down here it's fairly non-linear but it becomes then a, a linear relationship as you get to any appreciable currents. The circuit symbol for a IGBT, there are two different ones that are often used. The one here on the left looks like it's based on a MOSFET equivalent circuit, uh, I mean circuit symbol, with the addition of an arrowhead for the drain end where we uh, the arrowhead representing the injecting contact and the language that's sometimes used is drain, source, and gate. On the other hand another part of the technical community has adopted a circuit symbol that's more reminiscent for that of a bipolar junction transistor and so they use the term collector and emitter for the output terminals and gate for the input control terminal and it looks like a combination on the output side looks like a BJT symbol but on the input side where you have this straight line looking like a capacitor we've adopted the uh, that portion of it from the MOSFETs. Unfortunately for most of you both of these circuit symbols are still widely used in the technical literature and so you'll have to get used to both of them. Going on to the next slide we can now begin a discussion of the physical operation of the device. In the off state of the uh, IGBT, the gate is either shorted to the source through the drive circuit or we may even have a negative voltage between the gate and the emitter in order to guarantee that the device is off. That means there is no channel formed here in the channel region, so the MOSFET is off and that means there can't be any current between the collector and the emitter. So to be in the blocking state we simply have to ensure that the gate emitter voltage is below the threshold voltage. In the forward blocking state the junction J2 right here is your blocking junction and it has to hold off the uh, voltage that you're applying between collector and emitter and most of the depletion, nearly all of the depletion region is going to extend into that N minus drift region the same as is the case for the MOSFET. If we have a buffer layer, then the junction J1 is going to have a fairly small blocking voltage and so it won't have any reverse blocking capability. Also with the N minus, I mean with the buffer layer here, this structure right in here and the length of the drift region will probably be set by a punch through structure.
So when you have a blocking, I mean a uh, buffer layer, the N plus buffer layer, you're almost always going to have this device designed as a punch through structure for breakdown voltage considerations because the length of that region from here to here can be reduced compared to having a non punch through breakdown rating. And that means the carrier lifetimes can be made significantly smaller compared to an equivalent non punch through device. And thus, the punch through structure will have a faster turn on and, in particular, a faster turn off time. And I've indicated that by this last statement here that I'll circle. The buffer layer speeds up, especially the turn off time. Going on during the on state, what we do is we apply a positive gate to emitter voltage larger than the threshold voltage. In fact, we'll probably overdrive it quite a bit in order to have a fast turn on. We'll form a channel underneath the uh, gate oxide and your principal flow of current, as I already indicated here and is shown here again, will be in this direction through the channel to the emitter. There is, however, the possibility of this undesirable current flow which goes through the body region bypassing the emitter and then going to the emitter through the uh, short circuit where the body region is connected directly to the emitter. As a result of that current flow there is a resistance in this parallel current direction which we call the body region spreading resistance. And one of the things we have to avoid is too large of a voltage drop across this distributed resistance because if we get up towards of about seven tenths of a volt what that will mean is we'll have a higher voltage from here to the uh, emitter than we'll have at this point from here to the emitter because of the current flow in that direction. If the voltage at this point right here gets upwards of about seven tenths of a volt we're going to be turning on that base emitter junction on the parasitic NPN transistor. And if that happens, then the thyristor is going to turn on. So for that reason, the device designer is going to do everything that he can to ensure that nearly all of the collector current goes through the MOSFET and very little goes through this uh, body region spreading resistance. I'm not going to get into any more details about how that is accomplished. That's probably getting a little bit too detailed in the specifics of the operation of the IGBT. In the on state, your collector emitter voltage between here and here is going to be composed of the junction drop across the uh, injecting contact, that's junction J1 if you want to use that terminology, plus the uh, drift region drop and channel region drop. And so all of those three terms Here's your junction drop, your drift region drop, and the channel drop. Whole injection into the drift region from J1 is what minimizes that drift region drop, and which is probably the largest component of the overall on-state voltage drop between the collector and the emitter. Equivalent circuits for the IGBT are shown on the next slide. In normal operation, the circuit here on the left is probably the one that uh, best shows what the overall operation of the device is. On the output side you have a p-channel bipolar junction transistor, but it's a relatively poor one and most of the current coming in the emitter goes through the base, through the drift region, through the MOSFET, and then out the emitter. And again, just to re-emphasize, this shows again what the on-state voltage components are. The junction drop across the base emitter junction of the PNP transistor, drift region drop, and then the channel drop. A more complete circuit, shown here on the right, emphasizes the fact that we have two parasitic transistors. We have the PNP transistor and the NPN. And the addition of the NPN transistor and the body region spreading resistance is indicative of what the potential problem of accidental turn-on could be. We want the main current to flow as is shown here in this direction. However, if we get too much current going this way, because perhaps we're putting far too much current into the device and we get about seven tenths of a volt drop across this body region 
body region spreading resistance in a silicon IGBT, then the NPN transistor turns on. That demands even more base current coming through the uh, PNP transistor. Those transistors enter their active region and the thyristor then turns on and latches up. And so whatever we can do as the user of these devices, we should do in order to make sure that these devices do not accidentally latch up. The next slide indicates some of the beginning of some of these possible uh, static latch up, I mean latch up uh, problems. This one is called static latch up because we have too much current bypassing the uh, channel region and going directly through the body and out the emitter and thus giving us a fairly significant drop across the body region spreading resistance. And if that gets too large, as I've already indicated, we forward bias the junction J3 and turn on the parasitic NPN transistor. And then that will complete the uh, latch up of the parasitic thyristor. And this is going to give us fairly large power dissipation in a latch up, which could destroy the IGBT unless we terminate the uh, latch up very quickly. And the external circuit must terminate the uh, latch up because there isn't any gate control in latch up. Another possibility for latch up is a so-called dynamic latch up mechanism. If we turn off the MOSFET section very quickly, the depletion layer, which is going, is going to expand, as I've indicated here, into the drift region. And that expansion is going to be very rapid if we have a very rapid turn off of the MOSFET section. As it expands into the drift region, we are in effect reducing the base width of the PNP transistor. And as the base width decreases, its base transport factor alpha increases, or equivalently, instead of alpha, and this is a misprint, that should be alpha, not uh, A, that means beta also is increasing. And that means more holes are going to survive injection from the P region and drift across the base and be collected at the uh, collector, and thus we're going to have better transistor action. And that means that the transistor probably is going to also then turn on the NPN transistor, and that will be the end of your device because it will latch up. In general, manufacturers specify maximum allowable drain currents on the basis of dynamic latch up, and they may also have a VDT rating. That is the maximum reapplied voltage, the growth of the rate of the voltage growth between collector and emitter as you're trying to turn the device off. And so you as the user would be well advised to carefully look at what those limits are and uh, avoid them, if at all possible, in the normal operation of your uh, converter. Nowadays, modern IGBTs are much more immune to these latch-up mechanisms than in the early days. When IGBTs first came out, they were much more prone to latch-up, and so one had to be more careful. But we've learned how over the past 15 to 20 years how to make uh, very good IGBTs, which are almost virtually latch-up proof. But you would be foolish to assume in all situations that the uh, even a modern IGBT is completely latch-up proof. So always keep that in the back of your mind when you're using these devices. As far as switching speeds are concerned, basically the switching mechanisms in the IGBT are very, very similar to those of the MOSFET, since the MOSFET section of the IGBT is what's going to mainly dominate the transient behavior, with the exception of when we're turning off and we have an anode, or I mean a collector tail current that I'll get into in a little bit. You have the internal capacitances, particularly of the MOSFET, that are going to set most of the switching speeds, and the equivalent circuits that we have for the that model those capacitances are the same in the IGBT as they are in the MOSFET. The only difference is we use different terminology. Instead of gate to drain, it's gate to collector. Instead of gate to uh, source, it's gate to emitter. And on the output side, it's collector emitter. But otherwise, the uh, capacitance is defined in the same way. And usually, instead of a direct measurement of the gate emitter capacitance, you measure the uh, input capacitance, CIES, as I've indicated down here in the lower left and all the rest of the measurement 
or the uh, items that you find on a specification sheet in regard to capacitances for the IGBT or the same as for the uh, MOSFET. I'm going to talk about the turn on of an IGBT in the same way that I did the turn on of a uh, MOSFET and that is in a simple step down converter. So what we would be doing is at t is equal to zero we would begin to turn on the IGBT. I'm assuming that the gate emitter voltage will start at a negative value. We'll then ramp up changing the voltage across the uh, gate emitter capacitance and the gate collector capacitance in the same way as in a MOSFET. When we reach the threshold voltage the collector current can begin to flow. It takes a turn on time T sub Ri. Once you reach the uh, turn on, I mean you reach the load current, you have a, then a plateau in your gate emitter voltage and I guess I haven't corrected this one. I did correct a very similar one in the MOSFET section recently but what we should show is the collector current continuing to grow up to this point then having this plateau section right here and then growing onward to its final value when you reach the uh, end of the transient. So keep that in mind and make that correction in your notes. I will correct the lecture notes and make this uh, change and post it in a day or two. So we have the usual turn on delay time, the current rise time, and then the voltage fall time usually has two separate intervals, initially a very rapid one and then a uh, tailing time for the uh, voltage fall time because when the drain to source voltage gets uh, fairly small the effective capacitance between the gate and uh, collector becomes much larger the same as in a MOSFET. Turn off is essentially the inverse of the turn on process. We start from a large overdrive voltage between the gate and emitter terminals. We have to ramp it down to the value which is just necessary to hold the device in the active region so we can continue to carry the load current. We then have the plateau region and it's very analogous to the plateau region during turn on. During that time interval then the current falls after that time interval from here to here. In that time interval when we get to this point the collector emitter voltage rises fairly rapidly. When it reaches its on state value then the current can fall and it falls with two separate uh, time periods. Initially falling very steeply as the MOSFET is turning off. Once the MOSFET section is turned off we still have stored charge in the drift region that we have to get rid of and that is leads to what is called the current tailing time or this uh, interval TFI2. And one way of shortening that tailing time interval is by re either reducing the carrier lifetime or using an N plus buffer layer and using a uh, punch through geometry. And that's why we make the statement that the punch through structure will turn off faster because it'll have a shorter tailing time, the TFI2 interval. And it will be shorter first because we have a shorter drift region and thus we can have a reduced carrier lifetime and then secondly because we have the buffer layer which helps which helps uh, drain out the excess carriers because of the very short carrier lifetime in the buffer layer. The problem of the tailing current being overly long at turnoff can be further improved by using a modification of the basic punch through geometry. This is shown on the next slide. In this slide, what we have done is modified the basic punch through geometry by using what are called cathode, I mean collector shorts. These are analogous to the anode shorts that we see in the GTO. And the effect of these anode, I mean these collector shorts, is essentially the same as in the GTO situation. The anode short provides a path for the excess holes that are in the drift region to not only recombine much faster in the N plus buffer layer, but also to be exited out the uh, collector contact. Whereas without that uh, anode short, it takes significantly longer for the excess carriers to be carried out 
because there's no way for them to be swept out. They have to disappear by recombination. Another advantage of the uh, collector short is that it provides an integral anti-parallel diode as shown in the diagram. This diode can be used in some applications if it's well characterized by the manufacturer. However, there is a slight disadvantage to using the uh, collector short. It adversely affects the injection of holes into the uh, drift region when the device is in the on state. And so there's a trade-off that the device manufacturer has to make between having low on state losses but longer tailing times or shorter tailing times but then having to face the fact that the on state losses are going to be somewhat higher. But even after but when this trade-off is made in the optimum manner, you wind up with a device that turns off faster than the standard punch through IGBT and still has acceptable losses. Finally, we get to the safe operating area and we have two safe operating areas. In the forward bias safe operating area, the safe operating area is of course the area that I am illustrating here in red. It's bounded on the right hand side by the breakdown voltage. If you turn the device on very rapidly, faster than 10 microseconds, it's essentially you jump up to the maximum current that the device can handle and then you go across here. But before you hit zero volts, you then have this segment of the uh, safe operating area, which is just the product of the on state current times the on state resistance. And so you have this uh, part right here, which is a modification of the earlier one that I showed for the MOSFET. And I've since then changed the uh, notes on the safe operating area for the MOSFET and showed a very similar diagram. Most of the time, you're going to be operating up here at some finite on-state voltage, and that would be the end of your safe operating area. You're never going to get any lower except as you turn the device off, but usually you're going to be turning it off and going in a direction more like this if it's hard switched or in this direction if you have snubbers or soft switching. In the reverse bias safe operating area there's often a specification as to how fast you allow the uh, voltage to grow. If you grow it fairly slowly like a thousand volts per microsecond you could follow this rectangular path but if you're trying to turn the device off faster 2,000 or 3,000 volts per microsecond, your safe operating area is somewhat more restricted. And again, the reason for this limitation as you turn the device off is to make sure that you uh, don't have a problem with dynamic latch up. That is, having too large of a re growth of the reapplied voltage between collector and emitter leading to accidental turn on of that thyristor. That is uh, part of the uh, overall structure. Okay, I think this is probably sufficient for the purposes of our course, so I will uh, end this discussion of IGBTs, and if you have any questions, be sure to let me know.